Hey everyone, uh, my name is Deepa Karthikeyan. I'm founder director at Athena Infonomics. Uh, we're an organization uh, that's committed to finding creative ways to support evidence-based decision-making for public policy and programming. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here with my friend and colleague, Christina, uh, who I've had the opportunity of working with quite closely over the last couple of months. And um, in the context of just working with Christina and learning about the work that she's doing, I've had the privilege of learning about the significant impacts that childcare infrastructure and services have on everything. Um, a perspective that I must admit I did not have uh, before I met Christina and I had some of these conversations and learned about her work um, because as a professional that does work in the water and sanitation space largely, I really don't think I've had the opportunity to think critically about the role that childcare has on wash outcomes. And uh, I've learned over the last couple of months that it does. And it not only matters for wash, but it matters for all human development goals. Uh, and that brings us to really today's discussion, which is why everyone should care about care. Um, let me start with just a little bit of a background and intro, Christina, to the work you've done and then We'd love to hear from you directly because I, uh, I've i learned so much and I think it's shifted my own perspective so much that I think it'll be really great um, for us to sort of share this with a larger community. So Christina is a labor and development PhD economist and data scientist. And a lot of her work argues for why everyone should care about care and how solving the complex social and economic problem of the crisis of care, particularly as all of us have seen as sort of got was accentuated over the pandemic, will unlock long-term real bottom-up prosperity for households, firms, and nations. Um, Christina, over to you um, to really, and I'm, I'm excited because I've had the opportunity to have some of these conversations and learn firsthand, and I'm excited to have you here with us today to present and share this work. Thank you, Deepa. Uh, I'm so pleased to share my thoughts about this topic of why everyone should care about care, particularly for International Women's Day on March 8th, 2022. And I just wanna preface this by saying the views here expressed are my own uh, and not necessarily the uh, views of Athena or its employees. And I also want to express gratitude for the work of feminist economists, particularly those of color and in the global South. I just wanna say that there are many interlocking crises that the world faces today. And I sort of see myself as the another blind woman feeling the elephant, where the elephant is a set of interlocking crises. Right now, as I speak, there are geopolitical instabilities caused by war and invasion. There is the existential threat of climate change. And I also want to say that my contribution, I think, is that another existential threat is what I call a weakening infrastructure of care, which others have talked about in terms of the crisis of care or the care economy. And I wanna say that the elephant is a series of interlocking crises. Some are saying it's about climate change, it's about bad economic policy. And I'm not saying that they're wrong. I'm saying that they're feeling, I think different parts of the elephant. And I'm here to point out another part of the elephant, which is the weakening infrastructure of care. I use the word infrastructure in a very specific way. Many people think of infrastructure as a system of public works of a country, state, or region. And I'm using it here as referencing an underlying foundation or basic framework of a system or organization. Just like our Earth's natural resources are the underlying foundation of our economic and social prosperity, so is care work. Now, one thing I want to introduce is um, I want to highlight that for 
rich countries and developing countries, there normally is a decline in fertility. And is it a problem? Traditional economics have tra has normally seen it as not necessarily a problem because of this idea of a quantity and quality trade-off in children. You have less children, so you can invest in more human capital for them, more health, more education. And in fact, this type of story fits very well in an equilibrium of a growing, stable macroeconomy. What I'm showing here is that lower fertility is also associated with increasing female educational attainment. As females get more education in a growing economy that's more reliant on skills, the gap in years of schooling declines and fertility declines. That's pretty standard. You also see a decline in the gender employment gap over time. What I wanna introduce here is that declining fertility, some of it, some of it is about quantity quality trade-offs and the story of economic growth. But I am also saying that more recently, it is more a story of economic stagnation. Specifically, I am arguing that the expansion of women's educational and economic opportunity interacting with rigid gendered norms of caregiving has led to both economic stagnation and stagnation of fertility, which is driving, I argue, political polarization and many other areas of economic stagnation in the economy. The reason is because, very simply, as women get more education and more labor market opportunity, they receive higher wages. And that also means they have a higher opportunity cost for their unpaid care work. Meanwhile, in this growing economy, skills are more important and more highly rewarded. That also means that they want their own children to have greater investments of education. So as they actually have less time for care, the importance of more investments in care are also increasing. And I'm arguing that since women only have 24 hours a day, in a day, this is causing serious squeezes of time and other social dislocations. Here, now I'm going to pre present some evidence for economic stagnation. If you look at the cross-section of European OECD countries, so this is a set of high-income countries, you actually see that there's lower female labor supply and lower fertility. This cross-section is inconsistent with the normal quantity quality trade-off story that is referred to in mainstream economics. In that story, you have greater labor supply with lower fertility. However, the cross-section here shows the opposite. And I also want to point out that the pandemic likely accelerated these trends. There's evidence showing that female labor supply might have permanently decreased after the onset of the pandemic and schools and childcare centers were shut down. Many advanced economies now are also reporting sharp drops in fertility rates, and they may be permanent. Now, why do we care? In general, economic growth has been increased, has been fueled by increases in labor supply, particularly female labor supply, which has become more educated over time. In addition, we need fertility to be able to power the labor force and support an aging population. Solutions to, solutions for solving this, like immigration, are not necessarily stable. Well, let's take a look at this again. We've seen, we're seeing increasing female educational attainment and female employment. However, what is less understood is that if you take a closer look at the US and in many other countries, 
female labor supply has been stagnating. So previous decades of economic growth that have been fueled by more women entering the labor force, there's not much left to give. Female labor force participation has been stagnating in the US. And meanwhile, you can see that average weekly work hours spent by females has also been plateauing. Basically, there's only 24 hours in a day and women can't give as much, can't give both more time to work and more time to children. Let me show some other evidence, which is the role of public support for working parents. In the following series of charts, I'm going to show outcomes based on country outcomes that are categorized by their deferring level of support for working parents as of the late 1980s and early 1990s. So I'll be showing four different categories, social democratic, conservative, liberal, and Southern European. And I'm gonna show you how the outcomes for these countries have evolved differently over time. First, let's look at the fertility of these high-income countries by policy regime. As a point of reference, I also include high-income East Asian countries. We can see that overall, these high-income countries have experienced a decline in fertility. Not necessarily a huge deal in the story of the quantity quality trade-off. However, you can also see that in those countries, in Europe, particularly the Southern Europe countries with the least support for working parents, they have experienced the sharpest decline in fertility. Meanwhile, Southern European and East Asian high-income countries have the greatest gender gap in employment. You see that over the past decades, the gender gap in employment has been decreasing consistent with more female educational attainment and expanding female opportunity. However, you can also see that the greatest gender gaps in employment still remain with the East Asian and Southern European economies. The economies with lower support for working parents and more rigid gender norms of care. I argue that this weakening care infrastructure is a potential driving force of political polarization in many high income economies. Here, I show you a map of the growing polarization in the US government. There's growing evidence that actually women are not benefiting from this economic growth. There's more and more evidence that the well being and mental health of women in recent decades, and in particularly during the pandemic, has suffered. Uh, one of the first economists uh, to study uh, the decline and stagnation of female well being uh, was Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers. They document widespread declines of female well being, both absolutely and relative to men in high income countries, despite female improvements on a variety of objective measures, such as in education, self reported health, and labor market outcomes. They discuss it as being inconclusive. But I want to argue here that it is the weakening care infrastructure that I have discussed, driven by expanding female educational attainment, labor market opportunity, higher opportunity cost of time, and rigid gender norms, while facing increasing pressures to invest more in their children, and often with rising costs of education and healthcare that wages are not keeping up with. There are massive economic pressures that, that are particularly falling on females, all, on, on all of society, but particularly on females because of rigid, rigid gender norms of care. I have a few takeaways from this perspective. From the climate change movement, we are beginning to see how relying on fossil fuels to power our economy may lead to existential climate threats sooner than we expected. Now, many nations are thinking about shifting and updating their power and transportation infrastructure to meet the challenge of climate change. I want to say that relying on outdated social norms about caregiving to power our families, societies, and economy may also lead 
to existential threats to our fertility and social reproduction sooner than we expected. You are also hearing now that many large economies, including China and also high income economies are worried about their declining fertility. We need to work on shifting and updating our care infrastructure to meet the challenges of the care crisis. We need to shift and update social norms about who can and should provide care and how it should be compensated. Regardless of whether it's authoritarian regimes or liberal democracies, the most powerful nation state models in the world are still similar. They, were both, they all rely on fossil fuels to power their economy and they rely on unsustainable and weakening infrastructures of care to power their societies. Here are some additional resources that will also be pasted uh, for your references. I paste a few policy resources and influences here, and then also a few resources of academic works that have inspired me. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to future discussions on some of the subtleties of the topics I presented here. Thank you so much, Christina. I mean, there are just so many so many themes and so many layers to each of those that I, you know, and I know we were very intentional about making that this first sort of discussion and presentation an introductory one really by way of perspective setting. And I, and I think that was the goal. I, I, I hope everybody who will have the opportunity to watch this will, will have their perspective shifted if they haven't engaged with the question of childcare and the importance of how care infrastructure and services play into so many different aspects of human social development overall. And I, uh, I, and I'm, 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 and thank you. I think this is incredibly rich and I know there is a lot here. Um, the most important, and I just want to draw attention to how much care like climate is so cross-cutting and has an impact on all facets of human development and really how mission critical it is to get that story or get that aspect right. Um, and, I'm, and, and become more intentional about policy programming and financing to get that right. And I, at least in the context that I've had the opportunity to work in, I don't think there is an active conversation around this yet. And I, I'm hoping that through the work that you're doing, and I know several others are doing on this topic, we're able to sort of create awareness on both the importance of paying closer attention to this and being more intentional about it in a cross-cutting way, and also thinking about good responses and solutions from a policy and programming perspective. Um, this is just a first word. This is an incredibly important topic to human development goals. And as Athena and Phenomics and we're gonna to continue to have this conversation and come up and think about ways in which we can both participate, learn in and contribute to this dialogue. Um, at the end of this, we're also gonna post, of course, you know, details for those of you interested in continuing to have this conversation with Christina, who, um, who's working on this area or to learn more about it, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'll share resources and details about um, ways in which you can get in touch with us. Uh, thank you for those of you who, who are watching this video. Thank you for tuning in and watching um, this presentation today. And we look forward to keeping the conversation going. Thanks, everyone. And happy International Women's Day. Thank you.